Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Hello, and welcome to episode 239 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. How did the postal system work in early America? How do people send mail across the British colonies and across the empire? These are questions that you said you wanted answers to when you sent me your questions for episode 200, which was our listener question and answer episode that turned out to be an episode about different aspects of life in early America. Well, when I interviewed Joseph Edelman for episode 200, I asked him your questions about both the postal system and about transportation and how it all worked in early America. Unfortunately, I really had to cut the transportation-related questions from the episode because if I didn't, well, we would have had a very long episode. And yes, I know that episode was already on the long side. But I saved your questions and Joe's answers to them. And today, you'll get to hear my entire conversation with Joe about the early American postal system and how people in mail traveled around early North America and the British Empire. Now, I offer you this different kind of episode, you know, something that is both old and new and an episode that doesn't have our usual introductory or concluding segments because I'm traveling this week and next and I can't produce any episodes. Jacob, my eldest nephew, is graduating from college and my whole family is gathering to congratulate him and to throw him a big party. We're really proud of him. He's not only graduating with honors, but he's accepted an offer to continue his studies in a PhD program at Duke. Yeah, like I said, we're really proud. Okay, if you'll recall, Joseph Edelman is an assistant professor of history at Framingham State University in Massachusetts and my Omohundro Institute Digital Projects teammate. Joe is a historian of media, communication, and politics in the Atlantic world, and he's an expert on the early American postal system. Joe has also just published his first book, Revolutionary Networks, The Business and Politics of Printing, 1763 to 1789. And he is going to join us next month in June to tell us about this new book. So now, without any further introduction, I offer you Joseph Edelman answering your questions about the early American postal system and transportation in early America. Joe, it's a pleasure to have you join us, and we're really excited about it because We have a lot of questions about mail and transportation in early America that we hope you can answer for us. So to start, Walter would like to know about the postal system in early America. Would you provide us with an overview of how people sent mail to each other in British North America? Sure, I'd be happy to, Liz. First thing to know is that there are two ways that people sent mail in colonial America, the legal way and the a little bit less than legal way. So the legal way is if people were sending things through the British imperial postal system. So that meant that you were sending your letter through one of the several dozen post offices in North America. The limitation with that is that most of those are right along the Atlantic coast. So for any listeners who live on the East Coast or who've traveled to the East Coast, what's now U.S. Route 1, many parts of which are called Post Road, Boston Post Road, or something like that, That's the route that the main post office for the British Empire took in the colonial era. So you write your letter, you take it to the post office, you send it to someone in a far off town. That person, say you're sending a letter from Boston to Philadelphia, when it gets to Philadelphia, the person needs to actually physically go to the post office to pick up the letter. There's no such thing as home delivery until during and after the U.S. Civil War in the 1860s. And the person who's receiving the letter is the person who has to pay the postage. So you don't pay for the letter's shipping until it gets to its end point. And that's something that's true until the late 1840s. So that creates a problem because sometimes people don't ever actually show up to pick up their mail. Sometimes they don't want to pay to pick up a letter. And the post office has already paid, obviously, to do the transportation. So what postmasters would do, you know, say in Philadelphia, they would advertise in the Philadelphia newspapers with a list of people who had letters waiting 
to be picked up. And that would include people who lived in some outlying towns. If you lived in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, you know, some miles north of Philadelphia, you didn't have a post office, your letter would be delivered to Philadelphia and you'd have to find a way to get it yourself in Philadelphia. And then also these people who were delinquent and don't pick things up. So along the coast, if you're sending something within North America, it goes into a mail bag. It goes on a horse with a post rider. And there were a series of post riders along the route from Boston to Providence, from Providence to Newport, Rhode Island, from Newport, Rhode Island to New London, Connecticut, and so on and so forth in stages. If the mail was going overseas, it would go on board a ship. Most transatlantic ships by the 18th century had a mail bag that when a ship was getting ready to leave port, if it was leaving Boston or New York or Philadelphia or Charleston, wherever, the captain would place a bag in the post office or in a tavern or coffee house that if people wanted to send a letter to London, well, there's this ship that's getting ready to leave next week, put your letter in the bag and off it'll go. Beginning in the 1750s with the Seven Years' War, Britain created a system of what they called packet boats. And these were basically specifically mail ships that traveled from the west coast of England to New York, which is where the North American Post Office headquarters was, four or five times a year specifically. And that happens during the Seven Years' War because the British are interested most in military and government communication. They're fine with people writing letters back and forth. They're interested in people doing commerce through the mail, using letters to do their commerce. But what they really care about is making sure that their military and their governments can function. And so that's why it's during the Seven Years' War that that happened. All of that is the legal way. But the problem with doing it that way is, one, the postal system has a pretty limited reach. It's almost entirely along the coast. There's one postal route from New York up north to Albany, New York, along the Hudson River. There's one postal route from Boston that goes along the coast and one that goes inland to Worcester and Springfield and then south from there along the Connecticut River to New Haven, where it joins back up with the coastal route. But other than that, there's really not much before the revolution if you are inland. So it's got a pretty limited reach. And the second is that it's kind of expensive. So the people who are using it with any sort of regularity are government officials who have to, merchants who can afford to and in some ways can't afford not to if they're doing business at a distance, and then newspaper printers who are using it to access news. So the official post office system existed. It circulated news. It circulated mail. But a lot of people who were sending mail would take advantage of a second, less formal and technically illegal method, which is the using a friend method. So say you're a merchant in Boston and you want to communicate with somebody in Philadelphia, instead of writing a letter and then mailing it through the official post office, you hear that a friend is traveling to Philadelphia on business themselves you hand your friend the letter and ask them to deliver it to your correspondent when they get to Philadelphia. So that's the second way that people do it. There are also some of the post riders, these guys who work for the post office riding back and forth between two towns, who are sometimes caught with two mailbags. They'll have one that's the official mailbag for the Imperial Post, and then they'll have a second one on the side that you know, they charge much cheaper rates to carry the mail and that, but they keep all of it because it's secret and hidden from the British post office. So people are doing both of these things. They're using the official post office and then they're using these other informal methods. Okay. I'm really curious about this system where the receiver pays the postage. Say you're trying to send a letter from New York City to Charleston, South Carolina, and perhaps it's going by boat or perhaps by one of the postal riders along the coastal postal route you just mentioned. But along the way, there's a disaster. Say a storm takes out the postal rider's horse or sends a ship way off course. Did receivers pay extra postage for their mail when the British Postal Service took an extra long time to deliver their letter? You don't pay extra if it takes extra long to get there. But the question that raises is what if the letter is completely lost? Say, what if the ship goes down? And so what people who had transatlantic correspondence especially tended to do is they would send two versions of the letter on two different ships. 
so that they had a higher likelihood of one getting there. And especially if they wanted whatever was in the letter, if they wanted that to get there as soon as possible, that you give yourself a little better chance. Maybe you save yourself a day or two or four or five or a week, depending on what the various ships are doing. So they did have methods to try and counter that where you'd send two copies of a letter. That happens less, I think, along the post routes within colonial North America. That's really something that's a transatlantic phenomenon. And that's even more something that's a phenomenon if you're not sending it through the official post office, because then you know you're not paying double postage. Today, we send all sorts of things through the mail. Letters, books, magazines, perhaps a package of cookies. What sorts of items and things did early Americans send through their postal service and where did they send the mail to? So what they're sending is mostly mail. There's not as much what we might call today parcel post or, you know, package delivery, everything we order from Amazon. And that's because most of what's being transported through the postal system is being transported on a horse in a mail bag. And there's a limit to how much an individual horse can carry. Between Boston and Philadelphia, by the middle of the 18th century, there start to be stagecoaches and some early, they're not official freight businesses really until the 19th century, but there start to be enough traffic on wagon and on coaches that there's some parcel service, some packaging service. And people did sometimes use that to their advantage. So the rate for shipping something was somewhat favorable to the rate for sending a letter. Actually, it was more expensive to send a piece of paper as a letter than it was to send a parcel with the letter attached. And so there's this one postal inspector, a guy by the name of Hugh Finlay, who tours the colonies in the early 1770s. He's the surveyor. And so he goes around and checks each post road. He interviews the postmasters, checks the books, things like that. And one of the things he accuses colonists of doing is trying to defraud the post office by sending parcels. But you have to imagine me with scare quotes around the parcels. What he's accusing them of doing is taking like some bits of straw and tying a string around them and tying the letter to the bits of straw and saying, this is a parcel. Mail it as a parcel. It's cheaper than sending the letter. So we know that there were parcel rates. We know that there was some parcel service. It's not very big certainly not through the postal system, but it's there. It's really interesting that you said that colonists sent mostly letters to the postal service. And given what you said about post riders and postal horses, that makes logistical sense. Still, a lot of historians have claimed that paper was really expensive in colonial America, which makes me wonder just how many letters early Americans were sending because, you know, you need paper to write letters. Would you tell us a bit about the expense of paper and how this expense impacted the mail that people created and sent? The short answer is that it depends because there's lots of different qualities of paper available. So you can get paper at all sorts of different price points. But in general, in the 18th century, paper was more precious, was more expensive relative to other goods and materials than it would be today. And the reason for that is the material that it was made out of. In the 18th century, Paper was made out of rag linen. It was made out of old clothes that you would cook and get the fibers from and then turn into paper. So one of the things that happens is that paper mills, people who make paper, and printers who need lots of paper for their businesses are constantly advertising and asking and begging people to send in their old clothes, their rags to be pulped to make paper. So there's a lot less of that around, and it's a more expensive product than when they transitioned to wood pulp paper in the middle of the 19th century, right? Wood is relatively plentiful. On the other hand, that means that the paper is far more durable. So one of the interesting things about, say, going into an archive and looking at newspapers or letters today is that the letters and the newspapers and the books from the 18th century with linen paper are in far better shape than newspapers and letters and books and things like that from the mid or late 19th century that are quite a bit younger. Because when you make linen paper, and we know this today, when you print a resume or something like that, you print it on linen paper because it's more durable. 
So in the middle of the 18th century, you can get paper from local paper mills, and many of the colonies have paper mills by the middle of the 18th century, but it's not of the greatest quality. The high quality paper comes from England, which both because it's higher quality and because it's being shipped across the ocean makes it far more expensive. All of that means that letter writing, and here I'd separate out newspaper printing because they're printing their newspapers once a week as best they can. But for letters, letter writing is mostly limited as a regular practice to people at the upper end of society, people who can afford to buy paper on a regular basis and use it, military, government, merchants who have to transact business at a distance. So there are lots of people who write letters once or twice. Letter writing as a practice is not unknown across society, but people who do it regularly are really at the upper part of society. And then the last thing I'll say about paper and its expense is that people used the whole piece of paper when they were sending a letter, if they at all could. You might see, especially one that's traveling a particularly great distance, say across the ocean, where someone writes the letter and it's clear they date it several times that it's written in three, four, five sittings. You know, they find out a ship is leaving in a week and so they start a letter and then they stop and they come back a couple of days later and write a little more. Maybe the ship gets delayed. They add a little more to make sure that they're using as much of that piece of paper as possible because the paper is expensive and because I didn't say this part earlier, but the mail rate is based on the number of pieces of paper you send and then a little bit on distance, but the volume of paper that you send. So you want to write and use that one piece of paper because if you use a second one, that doubles the cost of sending the piece of mail. Okay. What about inter-imperial mail? What if you're a merchant and you want to correspond with a merchant and sent you stations? Was there an international or inter-imperial mail service that you could use? Or, you know, did you just have to wait to send the letter with a ship captain who was bound for that specific Caribbean island? If it's the official British postal system, there's a rate for that. It's significantly higher than sending something within the colonies that can be taken by a post rider. If it's through the private informal system where you're just paying the ship captain, then yes, it depends on the ship captain. If he's a friend of yours, he might do it for a relatively low price. If you're the merchant that owns the ship, he would take it probably for free. If he is going there and you have no other relationship for him, there might be a different rate, but it would be then up to the individuals involved to figure out what to say in terms of price. Now, what about Benjamin Franklin, Joe? A lot of historians credit Franklin with playing a crucial role in the development of the early American postal system and service. And we'd be remiss if we didn't ask you to tell us more about Franklin's involvement with the postal service. So what about Benjamin Franklin? I'd love to talk about Franklin. Franklin was a printer. That was his trade in which he trained. He published a newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette, for 20 years. And in that role as a printer, he needed access to information. All printers did. And the best way for them to get access to information in a timely manner was to become the local postmaster. When you're the local postmaster, two things happen. One, you get a stack of newspapers each week from other towns, and that gives you the first chance ahead of, especially if you have competitors, as Franklin did, to pick which news you want to publish and which news is newsworthy. And the second is people have to come to your house or your print shop to pick up their mail. They show up at your house. They say hello. They pick up their letter. They open the letter. They say, oh, my gosh, what's happening in London? And Mr. Franklin, the printer slash postmaster says, oh, really, something interesting is happening in London. Would you mind sharing that? Can I borrow the letter and copy that paragraph? So you get access to private news circuits, right? If a merchant has a friend in London, letters would include not just business, sometimes personal information if they were family friends, right? To be a little glib about it, how's the wife and kids? And then also sometimes news about politics. People are interested in that. And if you're the postmaster, they're opening that in your print office. It gives you the freshest advices, to use their phrase. So Franklin talks about this actually in his autobiography that he angled for position as the local postmaster. He wanted that for the access information, and he felt he was being ill-treated by the 
previous postmaster in Philadelphia, who was his rival, that he was not getting news in the way that he was supposed to. So in 1737, he gets the appointment as postmaster for Philadelphia within the British imperial system and says quite openly that it helped him a lot in terms of the news he could get, the access to people, the access to information quickly. And he's angling for even bigger fish. Within about a decade, he learns that one of the two deputy postmasters general for North America is ill. And Franklin spends then several months while this poor man is dying, angling to take his job when he gives out. In 1753, that happens. Franklin is standing there waiting and gets appointed as deputy postmaster general for North America and serves in that role for a little over 20 years until he's fired in 1774. And he is credited by most historians, myself included as the man who makes the imperial postal system in North America functional and profitable, which it had never been before. Parliament had intended for it to be contributing revenue to the treasury. And until Franklin got his hands on things, it did not. It ran at a deficit. So he did a couple things. He ordered a survey of post offices and post roads. In fact, during his career, ordered several. Hugh Finlay the postmaster complaining about bits of straw was the last of those, and worked to fund improvements in the road system. He worked to try and get improvements in bookkeeping and accounting and actually getting funds out of the local postmasters, some of whom would sometimes be, shall we say, forgetful in terms of when they submitted revenue that they were supposed to send. He worked to open some new postal routes, so it didn't really get off the coast, but a little bit. And some of those are thanks to Franklin. He was instrumental in setting up British post offices in Canada after Britain defeated France in the Seven Years' War. So setting up post offices in Montreal and Quebec and getting a postal route across land from Montreal down to Albany and Quebec down through Maine to the Atlantic coast of Maine so that there was a postal route that was much faster from Quebec to Boston. So he's pretty responsible for smoothing out a lot of the business of the post office and making it a functional institution in North America in a way that it really hadn't been before. Well, speaking of smoothing things out, sometimes historians also credit the Postal Service and the need to move goods and information around North America with creating new and better roads, canals, and even eventually trains. Is there any connection between the postal system and better transportation, Joe? There is, but there's a difference between what happens during the colonial era and then in the early U.S. So in the colonial era, in British North America, the postal system definitely contributes to the building and construction and surveying of new roads. But as I've said, its reach is limited. It's mostly along the coast. It's mostly this one route with a few branches off of it, and it doesn't go into the interior very much. So what happens away from the coast during the colonial era is really the result of the British Army and its road construction projects trying to reach interior forts and interior settlements and make way into the interior as a way to extend the reach of the empire. That's something that Alyssa Zercher Reichart talked about in episode 156. So before the revolution, Yes, to the post office, but in a limited way. And more of what's happening away from the coast is about the army. After the revolution, though, the post office is really the key driver for road construction well into the 19th century. And that's because the Constitution gives Congress the power in Article 1, Section 8, the enumerated power section, the power to establish post offices and post roads. And so Congress, starting in the 1790s, uses that clause to establish new post offices at a rate of dozens each year. So hundreds of post offices each decade in the early United States. And every time you set up a new post office, you have to make sure there's a decent quality road that connects it into the national network. So Congress then will fund roads to connect the post offices. And settlers, as they move west, figure this out. And so campaign and lobby 
their state legislatures and congressmen to get post offices in towns when they settle them, because that means you'll get a decent road to connect you up to the previous town or to the county seat or wherever and get you hooked into the system. Now that we're on the subject of transportation in early America, Dennis would like to know how early Americans traveled. So what was it like for someone to travel between, say, Boston and New York City during the 18th century? Slow. Well, by today's standards anyway. But of course, they thought of it as slow, but not slower than other times. So travel's never easy, but with the establishment of a post road, there's a relatively high quality road between Boston and New York, which means you can travel, if not in style, with some degree of comfort and speed. So there's the two routes from Boston to New York. One is down to Providence and Newport, and then along the Long Island Sound Coast, which is what's basically U.S. Route 1 today. And the other goes west from Boston through Worcester to Springfield, Massachusetts, which is what's now roughly the route of U.S. 20, each of which, by the way, are called Boston Post Road for a lot of their length, that those are the two ways. With the post road, you're able to make a decent pace after you think about what your exact route is, what makes the difference is your level of wealth and your mode of travel. Are you wealthy enough that you have a private coach or a private wagon? Are you riding a stagecoach, which start to exist by the middle of the 18th century? Are you riding your own horse by yourself, in which case you can't go very fast because you'll wear out your horse? All of that ends up making a difference in how fast you can go what sort of comfort you have, what sort of weather you're able to travel through, all of that makes a difference. And it does sound like you'd have to make a multi-day trip to travel between a place like Boston and New York City. So with that in mind, you know, as you undertake this travel, what were the 18th century equivalents to rest areas, restaurants and hotels? Yes, absolutely. It's an overnight multi-day trip. It takes almost a week to get between New York and Boston. If you're going really quickly on the fastest conveyance, you can do New York to Philadelphia, which is about 100 miles in two days, but usually it would be three probably. So what existed were the 18th century equivalent of rest areas and restaurants is that along these post roads, there are a series of inns and taverns where for locals, it's a place to dine. It's a place to gather and talk about the news, drink a cup of coffee, have a pint of ale or what have you. And then there would be rooms upstairs for rent for a night or two, if you needed them, for travelers, where they would have services for your horse, not upstairs, of course, that would be out in the stables, and services for you, and it would function, it's not quite like this, but the best analogy might be like a bed and breakfast, that you know you have a bed for the night and you wake up and eat your breakfast, and then off you go for the next distance to find another inn or tavern. We've talked a lot about land travel, Joe, but what about sea voyages? We sometimes read history books that discuss how early Americans ventured across the Atlantic, but what was their voyage like? Well, the first answer is that it depends (laughs) on a variety of things. It can depend on where you're going at sea. It can depend on what season it is. It depends on what kind of weather you encounter on a day by day basis. And then it matters and depends on how wealthy you are, right? So a lot of people do one voyage, and not a lot of people do many voyages, and then obviously there's sailors who are in their own class. No matter what, you're obviously thinking about being in a relatively confined space, not seeing land for days or weeks at a time, not having access to fresh food. If you're wealthy, however, there are accommodations that they described as not uncomfortable, and they have time to read and write and converse with their fellow passengers in their cabins or in the dining room. For the poor, the experience is much less enjoyable. They are not in broad spaces able to move about as much. They are not afforded even as good food as what the elite merchant might be eating in the captain's dining room, even though that's not particularly fresh either. So all of that are travelers who are traveling, for the most part, of their own will. They're traveling for business. They're traveling for migration. Very, very few people are traveling 
purely for pleasure in terms of making a sea voyage. It's such a big undertaking. The biggest number of people in the 18th century, of course, who were traveling the ocean, though, are traveling against their will. They're people who are African, who are enslaved on the African coast, and then forced into a voyage known as the Middle Passage across the Atlantic. And for them, the experience is miserable. They are packed as tight as can be, shoulder to shoulder, if possible, into the lowest decks of the ship. By the mid to late 18th century, innovations in ship design, if we can call them that, have developed so that there are on a single deck of the ship that might be six, seven feet high. You've got a middle level of bunks so that people can be stacked too high on that deck. So if you were an enslaved person, you only had three feet of headroom from where you were. You were chained to people on either side. You were given very little time above decks to get any fresh air. It's closed spaces. There's disease. It's not comfortable at all. And it's important to remember that that's actually the biggest number of people traveling in the 18th century, far greater than anyone traveling by choice. Now, to take our questions about travel a bit further in time, in fact, out of the customary period we usually talk about on Ben Franklin's world, Robert wonders which came first, trains or train stations? Trains came first. The first commercial railway in the U.S. was a line in Quincy, Massachusetts that hauled granite from the quarry in Quincy to the water where they're then shipped to Charlestown and were actually used for the Bunker Hill Monument. There's a passenger line very early on between Albany and Schenectady, New York. The first really major railroad is the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, which is founded on July 24th, 1827 in Baltimore with the intention of going from Baltimore to the Ohio River at Wheeling, Virginia, which takes them 25 years to get to. So railroads really change the game and canals as well. What happens in the 19th century is people start to discover ways of traveling and invent ways of traveling that are faster than people had traveled ever before for hundreds of years. So as of about 1750, you could travel as fast as you could for a very long time. On land, you could go as fast as a galloping horse. And on sea, you could go as fast as a particularly well-made sailboat sailing with the wind. What changes is steam power. You begin to be able to move against the current of air or water or against gravity. With steam power, you can travel upriver from New York to Albany on the Hudson River as quickly as you can travel southbound with the current. With a railroad, you can travel faster than you could with horses. And with a canal, you can travel more smoothly and more directly than you could having to follow the paths of rivers. We've asked you a lot of different questions about the postal system and transportation in early America. Are there any books, articles, or online resources you can suggest for those of us who want to take our exploration a bit further? Sure. I have a couple of suggestions, mostly for the post office. One would be the Mapping the Republic of Letters project at Stanford, which is a project that has visualized correspondence networks for a lot of major 18th century figures, some people, especially in Europe, Voltaire, the philosopher, and for Benjamin Franklin. And so there's a site that you can go to and look at the people he corresponded with and where he sent letters and when. If you're interested in Franklin and the Imperial Post Office, the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia, which is one of the institutions that Franklin founded, has digitized one of the remaining letter books that he kept as postmaster from 1748 to 1752. Of course, it's a much bigger project than just the post office. But if you go to the Founders Online website through the National Archives, you can look through the Franklin papers. He talks about the post office a fair bit. And then going into the 19th century, I'd recommend a site maintained by Cameron Blevins, who's a historian at Northeastern University, whose research is on the post office in the American West through the entire 19th century. And he's got a website with all sorts of information about where there were post offices, when they were added, when they were deleted, information about the financing of the post office. There's all sorts of ways and things that you can learn about from him. So for the post office, I'll recommend two books that are already out. 
One is by a historian named Richard John, and it's called Spreading the News. And that covers the early U.S. post office. So he talks a little bit about Franklin, but is mostly interested in the post office of the United States from 1789 up to the presidency of Andrew Jackson in about the 1830s. The second book, which is sort of a big, broad history of the post office across its entire history, is by a woman named Winifred Gallagher called How the Post Office Created America, and does a really good job sort of giving you a background of the post office from Franklin up to, I forget exactly where it ends, but roughly today. And Joe, how can we get in contact with you if we do have more questions about the early American Postal Service or methods of transportation? So I'm on Twitter is probably the simplest way, at J.M. Edelman. And then I also have my website, josephedelman.com, if people want to learn more about me or find other ways to get in touch with me. So now you have an idea about how people in mail traveled around early America, and in some cases, how they traveled around the early modern Atlantic world. If you'd like to explore other aspects of life in early America, be sure you check out episode 200, Everyday Life in Early America, which features Joe and two other scholars answering more of your questions about how people lived in the early American past. There are show notes for this episode, where you'll find more information about Joe and his book, Revolutionary Networks. You'll also find notes for everything we talked about today. Visit benfranklinsworld.com 239. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's Digital Projects team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Emily Sneff, Holly White, and Karen Wolf. Breakmaster Cylinder, composed our custom theme music. Finally, if you have more questions about what it was like to live in early America, or you have questions about some other early American history topic, send me an email, liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute.